why are the spawns just comically exposed on this map? Like, this is Sun City's dev server all over again. Like, this map would be so good. Oh, there they are. It's gonna miss. This map would be so good. I mean, look how different the terrain is to anything we've seen before. It's big for top tier vehicles. It's got cover, unlike Red Desert. Different routes to get to different locations, overwatch positions, good roads. But the fact that it is literally just spawn to spawn sniping means that even a really good map will just end up being complete garbage. How have Gaijin not learned this yet? That was a bad shot. I thought he was moving faster. Ah, I couldn't get to. I thought I could get to. Well, somehow that's not enough SP yet. Well, let's go find a bunch more bots to kill, I suppose. This is fun, Gaijin. Well, this is where they all tend to get stuck. Because their pathfinding was coded by a four-year-old. And there's none. None here. Great. I have no idea why all these bot kills are only worth like 40 spawn points. Can I MG this, this TRV-74? Like, how am I supposed to test these things if I can't spawn them? And I mean, whose fault is it that there's no players in this dev server, hmm? You took custom battles away for no good goddamn reason. You gave us one single map in rotation, which is garbage right now until the spawns are fixed. You still won't give players the chance to actually access the new vehicles. And your bots are so bad, the games usually take like three minutes to end. It's not fun. God, I love Gaijin's AI. That was 20 kills. God, I hate the dev server. You have no idea how many games it's taken me to get the 15 or 16 bot kills necessary to actually spawn this thing in. Without the game just being over by the time I do. It's 40. It's 40 games. Finally get to see what this thing can really do, though. I'm done. I'm, j I'm done. Fuck it. You're gonna make a dev server this bad, Gadget, and I'm not gonna show it off for you. With the A-10 having arrived in War Thunder 2 patches ago, this aircraft was surely not far behind, and now it's here. The Su-25 Gratch, meaning Rook, known to NATO by the reporting name Frogfoot, is one of the Soviet Union's most famous attack aircraft. And while in truth it's more comparable to the US Navy's older A-6 Intruder than the A-10 Thunderbolt in performance and capability, it's still used heavily by the Russian Federation's armed forces to this day. With the new War Thunder update named Drone Age, which according to someone alludes to the fact that Gaijin have become mindless drones with no love for this game anymore, we'll be receiving two new variants of the famous Su-25, with a basic tech tree variant and a premium Czech Su-25K. These are supposed to be, I guess, the main feature vehicle of this update, with the absolutely fantastic trailer showing off these aircraft exclusively in a sort of story-driven short film rather than a traditional teaser like we got for the A-10 or F-14 or even if I cast my memory back more than three years, the F4 Phantom. Honestly, I hope Gaijin does more of these. It would have been fantastic to see one for the F14A, and I think they could do a great one for like an F16 versus MiG-29 or F15 versus Su-27, switching back and forth between the perspectives of rival pilots. That'd be sick. By the way, lads, if you want to pre-order the Su-25K, there will be a link down below. That's an affiliate link, just the same as our regular one. And while you head down there and click on that, I'm going to go over the history of this aircraft and talk about what it'll be like in-game. Now the Su-25, as I said, is about the most famous attack aircraft used by the former Soviet Union, now Russia, as well as frequently by nations like Ukraine, Iraq, Bulgaria, and many others. The story of its development began in 1967, when the Soviet Ministry of Defense called for a robust, 
close-in ground attack platform to support the Red Army in high-intensity warfare, harking back to the days of the Stormovik aircraft, the IL-2 and IL-10. The existing attack aircraft in the Soviet infantry, or those in development such as the Su-7 and 17, did not fulfil the needs of such an aircraft, which consisted of a robust construction that would protect the pilot and vital components of the aircraft with relatively significant armour plating, twin engine configuration, cheap manufacture and procurement, and simplified requirements as far as ground support, allowing it to fly from relatively poor condition frontline airfields. Now where have we heard that before? Along with proposals submitted by design bureaus Yakovlev, Mikoyan, and most promisingly Ilyushin, who designed a heavily modified version of their earlier IL-40, which became the famously ugly IL-102, Sukhoi put forward the T-8 project, which produced flying prototypes in 1974. The twin-engine, single-seat jet aircraft was test-flown by Vladimir Ilyushin, the son of Sergei Ilyushin, who'd been responsible for the IL-2's design, and after winning the competition for the new Sturmovik, began production in the Soviet Republic of Georgia in 1978. It went on to enter service officially with the Soviet Air Force, the VVS, in 1981, though combat trials were conducted during the Soviet-Afghan War in 1980, where the Su-25 picked up its famous nickname, Grach from the call signs used by two Su-25 pilots in that theater. The Su-25 quickly saw widespread service in Afghanistan and had a dedicated export variant, the Su-25K, made from member states of the Warsaw Pact, such as Bulgaria or Czechoslovakia. When the Soviet Union was disbanded in the early 90s, many now independent nations inherited Su-25s of different variants, either continuing to use them or selling them on to nations across the Middle East and Africa, while Russia created upgraded variants such as the Su-25T, TM and SM, at least one of which I expect we'll see in-game eventually, making them still the largest user of the aircraft today. With four hardpoints under each wing for ordnance, plus two dedicated pylons for R-60 or R-60M air-to-air missiles for self-defence, a laser guidance system in the nose alongside the twin-barrel 30mm cannon, and the general design and role of the aircraft, it's rightly considered an analogue of the US Air Force's A-10. In performance, however, as well as in weaponry, we see something rather different. Firstly, and most notably, is the aircraft's speed, as while the Warthog will struggle to surpass World War II prop fighter speeds while carrying any level of ordnance, the Rook here will manage almost double that, topping out at around 980 km per hour with a combat load. On the flip side, the Su-25 doesn't have nearly the advanced ordnance capacity of the A-10, with targeting systems and weapons in general feeling a little lacklustre. The primary weapon of the type in reality was to be the S-24B, though this large unguided rocket ended up being supplanted by the standard Fab 500 iron bomb throughout the aircraft's lifetime. It could also make use of the KH-25 and KH-29 laser-guided air-to-ground missiles for striking hardened targets, buildings and tanks, as well as the S-25 tube-launched rocket, among others. Without the capability for TV-guided ordnance, however, the Su-25 had a relatively short reach, and can stack up against the Maverick capability of the A-10, or at least it couldn't if the Tech Tree A-10 had AGM-65Ds that were remotely accurate to real-life performance. The targeting system for these laser-guided munitions is the same as that of the Su-17s and the MiG-27M, rather than the more advanced and much more useful system on the MiG-27K, meaning that reliably using the KH-25 MLs against individual tanks is a struggle, and the close range at which the Frogfoot needs to engage its target at still subsonic speeds makes it a sitting duck for anti-aircraft systems like the Sergeant York or Roland. The manoeuvrability of the Su-25 also leaves a lot to be desired, and while substantially faster, the Frogfoot will almost always lose a turning dogfight to an A-10. Not that either should ever be trying to dogfight, though funnily enough it will happen in-game. This brings me on to talking about my concerns when it comes to seeing this aircraft in-game. The premium A-10A, which for now is actually better than the Tech Tree model, is extremely broken at BR 9.7, including in air battles, fighting a large number of first-generation fighter aircraft with all-aspect AIM-9L Sidewinder missiles. The Su-25, despite being faster, has less advanced air-to-air -air and much less advanced air-to-ground capability, meaning that while its dev server BR of 9.7 seems utterly ridiculous given the outmoded Su-7 BMK and Yak-38 at that BR, 
and the BKL and 38M at 9.7, the Gratch isn't likely to end up much higher come the live release of Drone Age. It's still a much worse ground attack platform than the 9.7 A10. In fact, the SU-25 and SU-25K will probably not seem all that special in ground battles, as most pilots will get most of their kills with the unguided S-13 rockets, familiar to top-tier Russian helicopter pilots, reserving the large KH-29Ls for use against SPAA that can and need to be engaged from longer ranges. While the SU-25 should definitely be good at that, that's nothing compared to the likes of the A-10, A-7, Jaguars, or F-4E and F-Phantoms, with longer range, standoff, precision weapons, and for the most part, better performance too. The Su-25, while faster than the A-10, still loses out when compared to its closest Russian rival, the Su-17, despite carrying more in the way of ordnance. It just doesn't have those long legs to get around, or the performance to defend itself, and against the MiG-27K, this aircraft is a bit of a joke. However, at such a low battle rating of what I suspect will be 9.7 come live patch release, this aircraft will absolutely ruin air battles, fighting only a few supersonic aircraft which are all themselves at the wrong BR2, rank 6 is a shit show these days and Gaijin are too ignorant or actively malicious to fix it, and a large number of subsonic Gen 1 jet fighters without flares, radar warning receivers, or even their own air-to-air -air missiles at all, not that an AIM-9B poses much of a threat to an Su-25. I'm sure you can see the problem. The aircraft at its current battle rating just doesn't fit in the realm it's looking to come into. Being a dedicated air-to-ground platform that most fighters it'll face in a down tier in RRB will be rightly terrified to come anywhere near it, while simultaneously being completely outmatched in the air-to-ground role just a single step up, and certainly if it gets a 9.7 BR and is up tiered into 10.7 ground RB matches, won't be able to contend with the anti-air systems it'll face nor match the precision attack capabilities of the other ground pounders. I know many of you have a persistent hate boner for close air support in general, so this wouldn't bother you, but it'll certainly upset the players who've already queued up to buy one of the things, as well as Gaijin who won't be able to push as many out to future customers. The TLDR is that as soon as you up tier it from beyond 9.3 or 9.7, the Su-25 loses its air-to-air -air potency compared to what's around it, meaning it gets compared to dedicated ground pounders in the ground attack role only, of which it's subpar to the A-10 and ends up back at 9.3 to 9.7, in a circling cycle of game ruining compression and imbalance. Now I'm not saying that the Su-25 is the reason for this, I think that goes to the Harriers from two years ago, but it is the latest demonstrator of the problem, it's just one of those aircraft that doesn't fit the standard model. This is something top tier was always going to face, that whole idea of performance and weapons capability going up and up in tandem with each subsequent new aircraft kind of ended in the 60s. But so far, Gaijin show no inclination toward dealing with that problem. This has me worried that this aircraft will just be left at a battle rating far too low for what it offers, namely the R60M all aspect air to air missiles, and that Gaijin will keep it there indefinitely, remaining oblivious to our comments about why it harms the game there, and instead paying attention to our wallets, which definitely don't harm them. So would I recommend picking up the Su-25K? Kinda, yes. Even if the Su-25s get raised to 10-3, they're still the best attackers Russia gets sub 11.0 for ground battles. But if you're not necessarily a Russian main looking to grind, and instead just a pilot looking to do some ground pounding, or someone who likes to play ground attackers in air battles, this is a difficult purchase to justify. You obviously get the standard Golden Eagles and premium account time with your purchase, as well as a pre-order bonus if you pick it up before the live release of the update, but it's still a lot of money for a famous yet somewhat mediocre jet all round, especially one you get in the tech tray anyway. What this aircraft shows needs to happen however is a whole restructuring of the process by which Gaijin balances dedicated ground attack aircraft like this, including those that are multi-role with better performance more in line with fighters and a strong air-to-air -air ability for self-defense, 
but are undeniably geared towards ground attack, like your Jaguars and Su-17s. It seems consistently that the more specialised these platforms are toward that ground attack role, the more stupidly imbalanced they become when Gaijin balanced them on a straight comparison to other, more multi-purpose aircraft in the confines of air battles. Shy of changing the way air battles work to better support ground attack as a form of gameplay, something I do want to see, Gaijin need to start balancing aircraft based on a combination of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground performance and capabilities, attributing more of the result one way or the other depending on what the aircraft is designed for. This basically means up-tiering every strike aircraft from the 8.7 to 11.0 range by one or more steps, depending on how specialised they are for the attack role, and thus how imbalanced they've been made. Chief among them, the A-10A. That also requires looking at the decompression of ground battles in order to not have Tunguskas fighting A-4 Skyhawks, which in turn gives more room to decompress aircraft that belong primarily in ground battles, regardless of what fighters they end up alongside. These just don't need to be effective air-to-air -air platforms, and you can go right the hell away with your introduction of separate battle ratings for air and ground modes, it shouldn't be necessary, and Gaijin can't even balance one set of BRs, let's not double the workload. And really, they shouldn't be, because when they are so good at both roles, their spam results in the fighters around them being compared in both roles, ending up getting down-tiered, and the community that's been screaming at Gaijin for years to finally decompress the battle ratings just gets more compression than ever. Again, I'm not saying that the Su-25 alone is causing this problem. I'm just saying that it's here to make it worse. If you want the super TLDR version of this argument, the Su-25, the A-10, these aircraft don't have a place in game right now. You put them at BRs where they're capable, roughly, they're completely overpowered in a down tier and completely useless in an up tier. There's just no middle ground because of the BR compression. Until that's fixed, these aircraft cannot have a balanced place in game. So whilst many of you are unhappy at this patch giving Russia two, in fact technically three, more capable high-end vehicles, just adding to their overwhelmingly powerful lineups, I'm more unhappy because I've been around long enough to remember what air battles were like before all these dedicated ground attack platforms came in to ruin it, and the Su-25 is just going to be more of the same. It's not a very impressive ground attacker, and because it's not all that impressive outside its missiles in air-to-air -air either, it ends up as a much lower BR jet than it should be with the gimmick of air-to-air -air missiles that nobody can counter. The A5C was bad enough, the A10A has been even worse. This could honestly be the worst of the bunch, or just another one to throw on the pile. Nonetheless, I hope you guys are geared to enjoy it, and I hope I'm wrong about where it ends up getting placed. After all, the AV-8 Harriers with Zuni rockets and a ballistic computer at 9.7 are already extremely powerful, and the Su-25, if people aren't focusing on its lackluster standoff ordnance, can just be a better version of that same type of attacker. The Su-25 does still surpass the Su-7 BKL at 9.7 in overall capability, and with the same kinds of weapons and performance that's at least closer to what you expect from early Gen 2 fighters, might end up getting a more reasonable BR, then calling for its closest direct comparator, the A-10A, to be raised in battle rating to match, and providing more of a positive to the game overall than a negative. Sadly, however, that's probably wishful thinking, because Gaijin loves bending over backwards to excuse under-tiered premiums, and even after so many years, the player base just keeps typing their complaints with one hand and opening up their wallets with the other. Anyway, that's about all I have to say on this today. I hope if you are pre-ordering the SU-25K, you'll do it through our affiliate link. It helps you, helps me, and nabs a couple of bucks from the snail. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, help us reach our 100,000 subscriber milestone, and make sure to tell me your thoughts in the comments section below. What do you think about the SU-25's addition, and what do you think needs to happen for Gaijin to be able to balance these dedicated ground attack aircraft? Does RRB just need some reworking so that aircraft can be stacked up in how good they are overall, including in air-to-ground, 
translating better into ground battles naturally. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, take care, and I'll catch you in the skies. But around the end of 2021, various Russian tanks, predominantly the T-72B and B-3, started to be spotted with these big rooftop cages sitting above the turret, and initial reports supposed that these were a measure to defeat top attack ATGMs. Now if you're not familiar with the concept of a top attack missile, you've almost certainly heard of them, with Ukraine fielding a bunch of them against the invading Russian army, consisting particularly of the Swedish Enlaw and the American Javelin. 